looking is in the back, page 64 of your bulletin. Um, uh, and I'll just say this is the informational meeting, which means the vote is tomorrow, but let me call the meeting to order first. Rochester Stockbridge Unified School District in-person and remote public informational hearing notice and agenda for May 2nd, 2022. The Rochester Stockbridge Unified School District Board of Directors will be holding a public information, are holding a public informational meeting in person at Rochester Elementary School by electronic means on this day, May 2nd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. to discuss Australian ballot articles on the 2022 Annual Unified District Meeting Warning. Good, and uh, obviously the information is out there. Those of you who need to get on, see we have we have a little hard for me to read these number names up there. So I'm going to probably get some help from somebody with better eyes. Um, so we have called to order, um, and uh, this is not our regular meeting. This is a special meeting, so we won't be going over agendas from previous meetings. Um, Additions or deletions to the agenda? I don't believe we have any. Um, and then we're going to go to our in, to our slideshow, which provides a whole lot of information. First thing I'd just like to say is welcome you all tonight. Um, now that we've done the official, thank you for coming out on a rainy evening, and thank you for joining us online. Um, uh, we're, we're quite happy with where our school is and where it's going. Um, we're certainly here to answer any and all questions you have about the budget and about other issues too. Um, um, that's on the agenda. Yeah, that's on the agenda. Questions that are on the agenda. Um, but uh, uh, there is a section at the end which is any other questions. So uh, um, we, our goal here is to inform you. Um, so please let us do so. Um, oh, oh, you moved over a little bit. Yep. We gotta hear what's going on. You can't hear from over there? Okay. Well, that's why I put the chairs over there. Do you want to sit in front of us? Do you want to sit in front, then bring, you can actually see bring it. Bring them right in front. Right? Yeah, that's why I put the chairs over there. Yeah, or bring the chairs or sit on the... Yeah. Right there. Obviously, we're, we're figuring out this uh, mixed media, um, both live you and know, virtual. I was going to say, you probably need to move them to be able to see them. The slide. The slide. So, you know, maybe we should come, come over here. here. Yeah. Come in front of this uh, table. There you go. <laughs> um, to start us off, I believe, Wendy. With our slideshow, correct? Oh, right. um, uh, well, we have to do introductions you're first. first my friend. What's that? Your first. My friend. Ah, very good. For a little bit, then I'll take over. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I am. My name is Ethan Bowen. I'm the chairman of the Rochester Stockbridge Unified District. Um, uh, uh, Amy Will, vice chair. And Bill Edgerton, member. Member. Patrick Hudson, clerk, you did it, good boy. <laughs> Robert Mayer, member. And on by virtual is Dean Kavakis, who is also a member. Uh, the administration, um, uh, Jamie Canarney, the WR, uh, the White River Valley Supervisory Union Superintendent is not here with us tonight, but in his stead we have Lindy Stetson, who is our principal? I guess you can introduce yourself, sorry. I'm Wendy Stetson. I'm the principal of Rochester and Stockbridge Schools. And sitting next to her? I'm Tara Weathero. I'm the White River Valley Supervisory Union Business Manager. And Anda, if you would. Sure. Uh, I'm Anda Adams. I'm the Chief Academic Officer of MTSS for the Supervisory Union. Right. And I, I, is this your first um, annual meeting with Rochester Stockbridge? It sure is. Great, so glad to have you. Um, I hope, you know, if people have, haven't have met um, Anna yet, um, really, really great to have her along on board with us. I'm doing a lot of great things. Great, introductions. So, um, the first thing to mind you is that the vote is tomorrow from 10 a.m. 
right? 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. at both town offices, both Stockbridge and Rochester town offices, unless you have already put in an absentee ballot. Um, and you can put that in place by 7 p.m. on May 3rd, which is tomorrow, the same time. Uh, good. Any other details? Or are you, Lindy's ready to take over? Um, so welcome and thanks for joining us. And um, to start with, we just kind of have some introductions of what's been going on at school because it's been so long since we've really had people in school from our community um, in the past two years now. Um, so we did uh, present and I put the links in there, but I can also share them with folks if they would like. At several of our board meetings and every board meeting really, we do a celebration of learning. So what's going on within our school? And so to highlight a couple of those, um, there's one presentation of literacy in the woods. Uh, that is something that the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students in Stockbridge have been doing once every other week. And that's kind of what you see in that middle um, picture there. April was poetry month. So she's reading some poetry that she wrote in the woods as well as some she picked out. That's a fourth grader from Stockbridge. Um, they also, one area we've learned from our academic data that our students struggle with is vocabulary and understanding different vocabulary. So they actually have a set of vocabulary words they take out with them and they've already researched the definition, but then they pair off in groups and have to act out the vocab word with each other. Um, and it's almost like a bigger game of charades, but also a different way for our kinesthetic learners to be able to really grab onto that information. Um, we also implemented this year an outdoor education program on both campuses with Amy Braun. And there's a presentation there. And on the left-hand side um, is one of our third grade students in Rochester. Uh, they did a whole unit on mushrooms and what's edible and why they grow and where you can find them. And they hiked to a lot of different local places, including out back here but also um, within the Rochester community to identify different mushrooms they've been learning about. Um, and that's just a highlight. And then on the far right is preschool learning, which also connects to one of our big um, implementations this year is we implemented a new mathematics curriculum and program this year using some of our ESSER money or our COVID money. Um, and that is preschool through sixth grade. And so here's some of our younger students um, are, in our four-year-old preschool program, uh, working on one-to-one -one correspondence. So we can count to 10, but we also know what 10 physically is, which is a big piece of that. So if you have some time and you'd like to know, these are just, the presentations are linked in there as they've already been shared out. Um, I hinted at we had some new educational programming that uh, this past school year's budget supported, that was outdoor education, uh, which happens two days a week for all our students on both campuses, preschool through sixth grade. We also have world languages um, for all our students. That happens one time a week on both campuses. We have something called Pathways, which is new and it ties into the Vermont law or concept of flexible pathways, which is the student interest-based learning. So they pick topics that they're interested in and they go out and learn more about them. And sometimes that can range from making a snow volcano and how volcanoes erupt to um, different mindfulness activities and other areas they want to strengthen. And we've tied some writing into this as well. We've also added a uh, math interventionist who shared amongst both campuses for the first time this year um, and works with some of our students to help close some gaps uh, they may have in mathematics. We have a school-based clinician and a partnership with Clara Bartman um, and she works with students uh, either per parent request or identify it who just need additional social emotional support. And then one of probably the favorites it might have been begrudgingly at first, but it's definitely a favorite now is we do mindfulness yoga with an outside instructor one time a month at both campuses. And I say begrudgingly because I think sometimes the older kids think I'm a little 
me for implementing it, but they actually really enjoy it and have become quite the balancers and can do all those different tricks. And I say that and I can't do that myself, but we try. Um, we're really proud of the academic growth we've seen in our students this year and uh, it speaks volumes to how hard our, our faculty and staff have worked at supporting our students to be successful academically. And one thing we really are focused in on is how much they're growing. It's really important that they're on grade level or exceeding grade level, but we want to ensure that they're growing at a rate that um, meets or exceeds the state expectations. Uh, so they are, how do I want to, so we're, meet, we're sending our students out into middle school and high school with a skill set that they need. Um, so what you see up here are a couple of sections. Um, we are just getting ready to start our spring testing. It starts tomorrow, in fact. But um, what you see up here is kind of our fall scaled scores from grades three through six um, from a benchmark that we take called Star Plus 60. And the goal of a scaled score is it kind of gives us a numerical number in comparison to the rest of the group where our kids fall on average. Um, and this is how we can measure growth because it's important that uh, those who are have lagging skill sets are growing tremendously, but also those who are exceeding um, the skills of their grade level are growing just as quickly or further as well so that we meet everybody from bottom to top and in between. Um, so this growth rate, we are seeing our students grow in literacy at two times the expected rate of, that the state sets for us. You want at least one time, you know, one time growth. And so for us to double that means that we are closing gaps, gaps excuse me, and exceeding the state expectations even for some of our students. Um, and in June, I'll have the results from our May. Um, so it's been great because we did implement a new literacy program about, oh gosh, three to four years ago, roughly. Mm -hmm. So we're really starting to see that work pay off around professional development, new materials for students, how we structure a literacy block, and more. And then our math, uh, Maddox growth rate, we haven't quite grown as much as we would like, but we're making significant progress. Um, we did start off right about in the average range for the state, and we're closing some gaps, and you'll see some grade levels, like second grade has grown tremendously. Um, fourth grade is, and third grade are right where we're looking for them to be. So that being said, um, it wasn't until this fall that we've implemented this new mathematics curriculum, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so it's great that we're already seeing some growth in our students and our learners. And so here's the new math program. Um, what we've been doing, it's more than just new textbooks. Actually, it doesn't include textbooks at all. Uh, but we have provided mathematics professional development for all our staff to go with this curriculum. We didn't just hand it to them. And, uh, and ask, uh, say, here you go, ready, set, go. Um, we've provided professional development that actually occurred over the summer, so they knew what to expect, and they were able to unpack all their materials. Um, this mathematics curriculum has structured a math block. Students are in mathematics class for at least 60 minutes a day, some 75 minutes a day. And during that time, they're using manipulatives, which is what you see both groups using on the screen. Um, they're participating in something called number corner, which builds their number sense. They have to figure out the pattern for each day. It's kind of like a calendar and you flip over a card and then it asks different questions. Um, investigation questions, some of us might know that as word problems or multi-step problems. And then um, math workplaces, which uh, we would call math games, but they work together in pairs, record their data, and there's a lot of skill sets across that, um, that those areas work on. Uh, all teachers receive mathematics coaching and data monitoring, meaning they're looking at their math data or their 
checkpoint assessments with every month uh, with our WRBSU math coach and my former co-principal Bonnie Bourne, which has been great resource right there and everybody's been very open to it. Um, we are doing academic checkpoints more, more frequently because uh, one gap we found is that you don't check to see if students got it or not. And you never know the answer until you come to the big test. So we try and check in a little more frequently. And then um, having our mathematics interventionist that's been shared between both campuses has been a great thing. We started with approximately 25 students receiving math intervention, and we have already exited seven of those students. So we're making huge progress. And then the next part for me is just really fun learning in action. We've had quite a wide variety of activities go on. I'm going to turn it back over to Ethan unless people have questions. Any questions so far on what's been happening at the school and principal? Yes. Uh, Could you I, identify yourself too, just because okay. they may not know you? Uh, my name is Walter Gollum. Um, I'm not here to question the budget. I'm, I'm interested in um, an approach to your your reporting, I guess. Yes. Um, this district has periodically or chronically had a large number of special education pupils. And I want to know how those special ed pupils factor into the literacy scores. And a and second part is why there's no literacy scores for grades one and two. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, our special ed students are in all of that data that you saw up there. So they're not separated out. We um, put everybody together in that category. And when we look at the data, we as staff, we do pull it apart because we want to make sure our special ed students are making the most growth in the shortest period of time to ensure that they're successful and we're closing. So gaps. my follow-up question. Absolutely. Is, why don't we, uh, as the public, know how well the special ed pupils are doing, and are they really driving the dramatic increases in literacy? Uh, some of them are. Uh, why we don't report out separately is because our special ed, the number of special education students we currently have is actually small enough, it's under 20 between both buildings, that it would be identifiable um, in some grade levels, especially when you pull it out grade level by grade level. Um, I could look at, and let me give you some, let me give myself some time to think about how I could report that out to you so you could see that. So it's not identifiable. The, the only reason I'm really curious is yeah. if there's a dramatic increase in those students who are, quote, special in some way, mm -hmm. that that, uh, that learning situation that could be translated into the, uh, quote, more mainstream body yeah, and absolutely. drive growth even faster than it is now. Absolutely. And we have taken some strategies that started with special education using what's called direct instruction, a specific program. And we started with special education and we now have implemented that, what we call tier two or our intervention students. So students who are not more than two years behind, but they do have some gaps within their literacy instruction. And we are seeing that data um, for those students to help close those gaps. And every teacher has been trained in di direct instruction. So both our classroom teachers, our special educator and our interventionists because there are lots of strategies within that overview training um, that benefit all students, including in giving an example and a non-example, making sure you repeat the answer, things of that nature. Thank you. Been doing that. And then, I'm sorry, you had one other question originally, and we dove down. That's right, it'll come out in the water. <laughs> yeah, one, oh, grades one and two in literacy, those students do not take that assessment. It's computer-based, they'll take it for the first time. They do um, what's called a benchmark assessment where they read with their teacher one-on-one -on -one and we check for fluency and comprehension skills during that. 
Um, and just a, there was a comment from online about um, saying the name clearly if anybody was asking a question. Walter Gall, a uh, Rochester resident, asked that question, as you know. Um, I, I think we can put in a little plug here. Um, one of the big um, incentives that uh, Superintendent Canarni has talked about since he came here was this idea of um, special ed is expensive and that the idea is that you want to be moving kids you want to be creating a classroom that's teaching kids in a way that they don't have to be in special ed anymore. Am I sort of correct? In correct. You know, we should be meeting everybody's needs in the, in the classroom. classroom. Without and special that ed. means that we're all interchangeable. Um, I expect my teachers and I, train, I attend every training with them to be able to implement it so I can step in do it and just like our special educators receive certain training our classroom teachers receive that training too so it shouldn't be we call it uh shouldn't be like you're going to a foreign country just because you change a classroom you should be able to get the same skill sets and the same supports regardless of where you are it's it's something that's happening su wide as well um uh is the idea that you walk into a first grade class in stafford and you can understand what they're teaching from. It's not there yet. It's it's a goal, though, that the idea of the vertical class teaching is is the same throughout the SU. Right. So there is some local control. You can still put your own um, spin on it. But the idea is there's some norms or expectations that what we see in a literacy block, which includes a reading group writing about are uh, reading a mini lesson where you're talking about fiction versus nonfiction. Um, those are like the big three. But the, I should be able to walk into every classroom no, what, no matter what grade level and I see those concepts happen within a literacy block. And then in a math block, I'm going to see number corner. I'm going to see um, workplaces happening. I'm going to see individual or small group instruction going on and I'm going to see investigation. Any further questions for the principal and the educational report? If not, we'll move on. Um, this is a Rochester High School building update, I should say. Um, obviously, there was a lot of discussion about the relationship to the, the uh, high school building to the elementary school that's here, and, uh, and the board has made some uh, decisions about that over the last couple of years as far as how we were going to or not use that building. And just say well, right now, we're, it, it, what's happening with that building is a holding pattern. There is a very in-depth study happening to the Envision Rochester and the Rochester Select Board into how to best utilize that building in the future if the town should take it over. Um, uh, and there are some very good ideas happening there and some real possibilities that can't be talked about um, because of details, but um, it's, it's quite exciting. Um, uh, that said, we've, we still hold to the board decision that um, there's no educational activity to happen in that building. Also, there was some pipes burst in the technical area and they're still, they've been repaired so it's clean, but they haven't been finally done. There's some issues with safety about the building as far as people using it. But we have made the decision that no educational activity will happen there. It can be used by the town, I think for voting. It's also been used by the Suzuki Institute this summer for rent paid. Um, and that uh, the town of Rochester is paying funds to offset the fuel and electricity costs so that Stockbridge will bear no um, expense keeping that building open while this uh, feasibility study happens. Any questions on that? Uh, yes, Marsha. You didn't mention the White River Valley players. Did you include them as people who can? Yeah, they're, they're absolutely. It's a rental fee. I mean, okay, those are just the ones that are there and, and, and the players. Exactly. They are used by board request. Yes. Okay, that's used by thought. board request. Yep. And that's what they did in the last year, I think, <laughs> yes, in the fall. Yeah, yeah. They, they submitted a form and we worked out an arrangement and they, and they used the space and it worked out very well. 
Right. Well, because it is the only place with an auditorium within many, many, many miles. Mm -hmm. We worked really hard as one of the players. We worked really hard um, to redo all the seating and everything after I raised it. Would like to continue to be able to use it. Oh, yes. Well, no, it's ter certainly open to that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I know. Should I know. Term, I just want you to mention it because I just want to make sure. Thank you. Yep. Sorry about you. No, no, not at all. That's what we're here for. Any further questions on this? If not, we'll move on. Is this on the? No, this is. This you, Carly. Exchange the audio. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. This is usually where Superintendent Kanarni speaks about what's happening at the supervisory meeting. So I'll go over the slide on his behalf. So at the SU, we are focusing on math instruction and intervention, as we've discussed um, also here in Rochester Stockton, that is the SU wide initiative. We are investing a lot of our ESSER funds, which were the COVID Relief Act funds, uh, towards math intervention and the math program that we're rolling out in the majority of our schools. We have an increased focus on social emotional learning and the supports that are in place for students. Personalized learning and pathways program, as Lindy had mentioned, that's the flexible pathways. That's an important process that we'll go through in the future for all of our students. And then increased focus on proactive communication and visibility within our community. As you see, Superintendent Kanarni sends out community updates on a regular basis just to make sure that all stakeholders know what's happening in the supervisory union and throughout all of our member districts. If I may add to that too, one of his personal priorities as superintendent is, is to get into the schools more. He's really made a point to be in the classrooms, in the schools to see what's happening, which is you know, not something that happens with a lot of superintendents, and but it's something that he has said is a priority for him. And we, as the SU board, which I'm on, um, uh, support it um, and, and really encourage him to do that. Any question on the WRVSU priorities? Excellent. We'll now go over the individual articles. Um, and most of these are fairly straightforward um, until we get to Article 7, which is the actual budget numbers, at which point we'll get much more detail um, on this, and there'll be individual slides sort of explaining that from various different points of view um, that Tara will be able to answer for you. Um, but first, uh, we'll just read Article 4 uh, to fix the salaries in the amount of $2,000 for board chair $1,350 each for vice chair and clerk, and $1,100 for all the other members for the school district officers for the 2022-2023 school year. Any questions on that? Okay, then we'll move on to Article 5. To fix the salary in the amount of $1,300 for the school district treasurer, for the 2022-2023 school year. Fairly straightforward. Any questions on that? Um, are yes. either of these changed from prior years? No. Article 5 actually did. We oh, did go up? That's right. We increased the treasurer's that. salary because there is substantial work that the school district treasurer has to and they were get, and they were getting paid like 700, 700. Yeah. yeah they were getting paid 700 i remember that we, we wanted to double that it's, it's a tremendous amount of week it's, it is work. and it's, it's like bi monthly like twice a month or yes. even once well a it's, week. it's it's constantly i mean she has to deposit your checks as they come in yeah. and she tracks your deposits she tracks um, she reconciles your bank to match up with how I reconcile your bank account. Yeah. There's a lot of work. It's a good job. And she yeah. has to sign all your checks and take on all that responsibility. It should probably be more. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think we're working toward that. Um, uh, but we're very appreciative of that work. Article 6. Shall the voters authorize the school board to borrow money by issuance of notes not in excess of anticipated revenue 
for the fiscal year July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. Any questions on Article 6? And this is what allows the school district to pay their bills and to pay their payroll until tax revenue is received by the education fund and by each of the two towns. All right, and now Article 7, which is the actual proposed 2022-2023 budget. Um, do you want me to read it for you? Or? Okay, go for it. Article 7. Shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $4,430,385, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in an education spending of $19,321.11 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 3.1% higher than spending for the current year. So the next slides that I'm going to go through give some background and then it will take you step by step through the budget, how we get to your tax rate that actually ends up on your tax bills. Can I ask a more general question before you go to that? Mm -hmm. Do you know, and obviously the state must know, is there a difference in the cost of educating a rural student versus a, an urban or a metro student, say yes. a Burlington or a Rutland student? And is the cost higher in the rural districts? Yes. The driving factor with your per pupil spending is your actual education spending amount in your budget divided by your equalized pupil. Equalized pupil is a two year rolling average of your average daily membership with weighting factors. So the lower pupils you have, the more it costs you to educate your right students. But currently, in the yes. okay. get there. good <laughs> great thank you so we're going to start off by how we started in this fiscal year at the end of 2021 for our fy21 audit we had a general fund surplus of four hundred sixty one thousand one hundred and ninety seven dollars in the fiscal year of 2021 our SUD ran a surplus of $765. Again, this is based on all your audit numbers. So at the end of 2021, your surplus was $461,962. At the end of quarter two, we were projecting an additional surplus of $300,881. Should say an additional surplus? It would be the current projected surplus, $300,881. Yes. I was at the end of quarter two, so a lot of expenses hadn't been realized at that point, also. But that that is not technically an additional it's surplus. It's the current projected surplus for this, for this year. Current fiscal but that year. isn't plus. The 400 is it? What of what's not used of the 400, which we'll get through. So budget changes on if you have your mailer, the actual budget for the expenditure side starts on page 31. And this is rolled up by function and object code. Function is generally what it is. So if it's general education, foreign language, each of your departments, and then the object is salaries, benefits, contracted services, and et cetera. So budget changes. The spending from 2021 to 2022 increased 101000 $101,633. Your revenue has decreased by $71,069, which results in your education spending. Again, this is what you collect in property taxes and what you receive from the Ed Fund. 
increases $172,702. Your equalized pupil did increase this year. It went from 172.19 to 175.95, which is a 3.76 increase. I just want to stop you there, Tara. It is actually on page 21 in the mailer. That shows. Um, oh, you're the actual budget is what I was referring to. Oh, okay. uh, this is not chart, my chart. As you were going through yeah. is on page yeah. 21, if that was more helpful to follow along. But, sorry. No worries. So the per pupil spending, as we outlined in the article itself, which is what you have to vote on, increased $581.07. And that's a direct result of your spending increasing and your revenue decreasing, resulting in having to collect more funds from the Ed Fund and property taxes. So the budget priorities, as you'll see throughout the expenditure budget, are to continue to offer a rigorous creative education that works with all the resources available. And we are increasing and continuing offerings that may be reviewed previously in the presentation, your outdoor education, world language, math intervention, and music and art. So those are the areas in the budget that we focused on. So each year, if you have a surplus by statute, you are required to use the surplus to offset what you need to collect in taxes, or you as the voters can elect to allow the school board to transfer some of that surplus into special revenue funds, like building reserve funds, capital improvement funds, tuition reserve funds. So historically, in the statutes there, I'm not going to bore you with reading that. So over the years, in the 2018-2019 budget, the surpluses that you have used was $181,639 to offset as offsetting revenue. In the 19-20 budget, you used $236,516. In 2021, you used $142,987. And last year for 21-22, we used $173,600. And in this fiscal budget, if approved, we are using $150,000 to offset tax revenue. So the next slide is the actual revenue budget, which you can find on page and let me just interrupt if you have questions as we're going through these pages please um you know make yourself known um i think you can raise your hand on online and certainly over here raise your hand if you have any questions so tara do oh, I, this is walter gollum again <laughs> do i assume that when you are offsetting it by one hundred and fifty thousand? You're anticipating the surplus is going to drop from 301 to 150. That is what we're using portion of the surplus for is your offsetting revenue. As the further articles down in your warning, your board is also asking you to use some of your surplus to go into your reserve funds. Got it. Thank you. So the revenue budget is on page 43 of your mailer. This slide here, just so it doesn't cause confusion, is structured a little bit differently than your actual revenue budget. So just be prepared for that. It's funny on the screen, but it's right on mine. So prior year balance carry forward, which is what we were just discussing, we reduced that by $23,600. We increased your interest $7,000 based on what we're currently receiving in interest in your bank accounts. The tuition revenue, we have decreased $33,900, and that's based on your current enrollment of students that you're receiving from outside of the Rochester Stockbridge Unified District. Same thing with the tuition for the pre-K, those are students that you're receiving from outside of the Rochester Stockbridge District. So that's also based on current enrollment, so we decreased that by $2,816. 
The forestry grant, uh, you get that each year because portions of your property are owned by the, the Forest Association. So you can't collect property taxes. So the government gives you funds for that. And each year, uh, those funds slowly decrease. So the projection for that is a reduction of $652. Miscellaneous revenue is what you receive uh, throughout the year. Like the Han if you go to Hannaford's grocery store and you give the $3 because you spend X number of dollars and that gets paid to the district. So we've kept that at $1,000. That's just one of the examples of what goes there. Your Act 60 transportation reimbursement. This is the reimbursement that you receive from the state of Vermont uh, based on your transporting your students on the school buses from home to school. And that projection is based on contracts is a reduction of $522. The Medicaid revenue that you receive from the supervisor union, which pays for your nurse, um, we kept at the same $75,152. And the grants from the supervisor union, there's a reduction there of $16,580. And that's based on the current fiscal year's grant revenue that we're receiving. And it's based on your free and reduced numbers. So the applications that families need to complete to, to see if they qualify for free and reduced lunch drives what is allocated to Rochester and Stockbridge campuses for our Title I federal funds. So that is what consists of your local revenue. And then the state funding is what we receive on behalf of the state. So that's your education spending, which is what we collect from property taxes and from the Ed Fund, your small schools grant, which has maintained consistency, and then the tech center paid by the state. So this is a preset dollar amount that we receive from the agency of education each year prior to budgeting that what they project they're going to pay tech centers on behalf of Rochester Stockbridge Unified District for our students who are attending a tech center. And this is a wash in the budget. It's both a revenue and the same number is also on the expense line. Any questions on the revenue? Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. How we calculate your tax rate. So we take to get your per pupil spending, it is your expenditure budget minus your local revenue divided by your equalized pupil. From there, we get your equalized tax rate, which is the per pupil spending divided by the yield, less the merger incentive. And then your final tax rate that's projected to be on your tax bill is the equalized rate divided by your common level of appraisal. So now we're gonna go over each one of those factors in the rest of the slides. So tax calculation. Again, you start with your per pupil spending of that $19,321.11. We divide it by the yield, which based on H737, which passed the House at the end of March, is projected at that 13,472. That final yield is not set until the legislature adjourns. So there still could be a potential change in the yield. And we get our first draft of the yield in the December 1st letter from the tax department. So if you were following the budget process throughout this fiscal year, you would see that we use some different yields. And I go over that in the business manager's letter, the differences that we use there. And there's a slide about it further on. So again, take per pupil spending, you divide it by the yield, and that gives you your preliminary tax rate or your equalized tax rate of the 1.4342. The merger incentives have gone away. We no longer get that. So again, your equalized tax rate is that 1.4342, which is a reduction of 22.17 cents over last year. Any questions on that before I move on? Equalized pupil. So Ethan, this is what you were about to say earlier. This is the historic view of Rochester Stockbridge equalized pupil going back to the 1819 school year. 
So you can see we've had a substantial decline up until this year where we did have that increase to the 175.14. So the yield impact. So again, the yield is the factor that we use to convert between the per pupil spending and the equalized tax rate. So again, that formula per pupil spending divided by the state yield. And it's adjusted uh, depending on how much the state needs to collect via property taxes. So again, that's why it's gone through the tax department and the legislature. So in the fiscal year 22, the yield was $11,385, which resulted in an equalized tax rate of 1.6359. In December, when we received the notice from the tax department to use, we had a conservative option and then a not so conservative option. So we used in all of our districts, the conservative option at that $12,937 which would have resulted in a tax rate of 1.4935. And again, in March 2022, when they passed H737, that had a proposed yield of that 13,472, which results in an estimated tax rate of 1.4342. So depending on which yield you end up with, you can see how it impacts your tax rate. Any questions on that? So common level of appraisal. This is dependent on each individual town within the state. And it is the comparison of your town appraised value to recent actual sale prices. And this is the factor that converts the district's equalized tax rate to the final tax rate on the individual town's tax bills. So we take the equalized tax rate and we divide it by the individual town's CLA. So you can see for Rochester, which is the first columns on the left, in fiscal year 22, your CLA was 102.98%, which resulted in a tax rate of 1.5886. In fiscal year 23, your common level of appraisal is 95.63%, which results in a tax rate of 1.4997. So again, the factor that's making that look more favorable is the property yield. On Stockbridge, last year, your common level of appraisal was 101.36%, resulting in a tax rate of 1.6140. And for 23, your CLA is 90.10, resulting in a property tax rate of 1.5918. And the next slide just gives a historical view, and this is also in my business management report in the mailer, um, of where your CLAs have gone. So I'm going to reread Article 7. Shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $4,430,000? Four million. Sorry. That's right. We'd be going home right now. That's right. $4,430,000. Four million three hundred eighty-four thousand three hundred eighty-five dollars which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $19,321.11 for equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 3.1% higher than spending for the current year. So although your your per pupil spending went up, your property taxes are projected to go down. Which is incredible. As Bill Edgerton will attest, that those two things happened is just amazing. Yeah, we're very fortunate that we've got a combination of the benefits of being a unified district, uh, strong leadership, synergy, uh, efficiencies of sharing resources and information and talents, um, combined with a, a state and federal 
governments that see the value of providing um, economic assistance so that we can have a viable education system in rural Vermont and rural Vermont because we have fewer kids. So they automatically the cost per kid. Well, cost kid, one kid less doesn't mean one less teacher or anything else like that. So we've got that going for us and uh, the performance of our teachers or administrations as, as Lindy spoke is going up. Um, people won't believe this, but this budget this year, if you're paying um, um, whether you're paying based on your income or you're paying uh, by your um, the assessed value of your property has gone down. And the number is in Rochester, if you paying by your assessed value, it's down over 5%. Stockbridge is less than that, it's 1.4. The difference is com the changes in common level of appraisal, but it's gone down performance, educational performance, academic performance is up. Two thirds of our residents in Vermont pay their school tax based not on the assessed value of their property. They pay it based on their income. We're one of the unique states in this country that uh, act six to eight that allows that to happen. For those two thirds of our residents, um, the school tax this year is not going down by 5%, it's going down by over 12%. Now that's not going to happen every year, but I look back the last six years and it's it's gone down. Now that's not something we can do forever because that's if we get into kind of uh, I don't know what would you one call year, that even one year at a time. I'm adding one, one year at a time, one but I just want to say is this year is special not only because of our academic performance, but the taxpayer actually is going to get some relief, and I think that's something to celebrate. Ethan, question? Yes, Nancy Woolley. Nancy Woolley. Nancy Woolley. At what point um, will the state trigger a reappraisal of properties? Good question. I don't know. Oh, oh, our business manager is looking it up. It's in my report. I still uh, have it memorized. When the CLA is below 85% or above 115%, the town must reappraise. Otherwise, I believe the listers have the ability to petition for a reappraisal. Okay. I, I have that. Yeah. Sorry, another question, Walter? This is more for you, I think. What happens if we have a repeat performance of one town denying to accept the budget and the other town does? I, I wouldn't even bother speculating personally. Is it combined? Yeah, it's all combined. Oh, so the vote is combined. Yeah, it's combined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Separate votes. Yeah, yeah. The okay. overall yeah. results are combined. Okay. I mean, I, I got to say, the majority. Yeah, and, and then that's one of the things. Um, if you read my 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 letter, or the letter from the board report, um, really, it's been extraordinary. Where we really could have just been sort of dusting off our wounds after all the turmoil. We went through in the last several years all for very good reasons until people really understood where we stood but the fact is that our school we've really created in this year a school you know with two campuses uh, in incredible ways in terms of how are you know unifying our teaching i mean no could go on about this but the, it's really extraordinary the feeling of i, I gotta say and unless people come back and tell us otherwise we're feeling like there's a lot of trust out there that our administration and our board and our SU is doing a good job right now, or is doing the right job, if not perfect job, is doing a good job. And I gotta say, I mean, it's a very exciting time to be on the board because we have such a good administrative team and so, you know, um, at the SU level and at our um, school level. But um, I mean, the, the conversations we're having in our board meetings are about educational improvement and numbers and how do you do that and how do you teach the teacher to understand the results they're getting back from a test so that they teach specifically that child this way to improve their scores to improve their their learning it's extraordinary i mean you know from where we were those of us who were on this board two years ago or three years ago 
it's a complete change in 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 in, in how this how this school is going. And I and I credit that to that we're really becoming a school, you know, a, 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 a one school. And uh, and and and, and uh, that it just it surprised me when I sort of realized it after you know we're still sort of ready for crisis and we're just we're not in crisis we're we're in education mode and it's great it's a great place to be we we can celebrate our kids and our, and our teachers and the learning at, exactly. at every meeting and it's exactly. that's the exciting stuff that we're working on. Yeah, it feels really good, <laughs> especially those of us who, you know, been been around for that. Great. We need to go on now to the other articles, I believe. All right, we have no more questions. Are there any other questions on the budget? On the budget. Thank you, Tara, very much for a very comprehensive analysis. Carl Brock has a question. Go for it. Uh, Hi, Ethan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, first, a uh, very informative uh, presentation. What I'm curious about, just on the budget in general, um, where do we stand with the amount of money that's being budgeted for uh, uh, repairs, maintenance, uh, bigger projects, smaller projects, in terms of are we on track to be replacing the things that we need to be replacing on, on the schedule they need to be replaced on? Are we deferring things? Are we getting caught up on maintenance and filters and the various uh, ins and outs of, of maintaining two persnickety buildings? Well, I don't, first thing I'll say, I don't know that you can see it, but behind us is the brand new ventilation system for the uh, gymnasium, which I now extends throughout the entire school, right? Do we have the right, new ventilation system? Right, there's two system? pieces. There's one yeah. in the preschool classroom, which is right yeah. off here, and then our ventilation system has been updated. Carl, it's like you know what the other articles are. Um, yeah. We are in the process of an audit with EEI services. Thank you. Who has come around and looked at all those the boilers? The that energy are, audit. Energy audit. Thank you, Patrick. You can probably speak better to it. <laughs> I can. Um, and so they are in the process of preparing a presentation for us. But we also acknowledge, and that's why you see Article uh, Nine, Ten, and Eleven, that we are going to have to start putting some funds aside for some bigger projects. So we're not in crisis mode that like the heat's not gonna turn on or something. I don't wanna, I don't dare say that too loud because it'll snow again or something next week. Um, but so that is kind of the goal in mind as well as we're gonna be working with um, around this energy audit. Well, that, and, the, and the really interesting thing for those of you who haven't been at our regular meetings in a while, um, this EEI is a really innovative outfit in that what they do is they go and assess, they're doing this across the SU, they're assessing every building in the SU. Um, and what they do is they say, okay, here's some, here's some basic stuff that needs to be done, here's some, you know, you might want to look at this and here's the gold standard of everything to do. But what they do is they guarantee a savings on your energy costs that then end up paying for many of the repairs. So instead of having to go into a bond vote, you actually end up paying for the repairs by your energy savings. And Jam Jamie's been really pushing this over the last year and, and, and it's very exciting and they were really great. We've met with them once so far as a board and they're gonna come back with their specific proposals for us. Patrick's on the committee. Oh yeah, you're on the committee, that's right. Go for it. Well, we haven't had, had a meeting in a while, but the other, I just gonna say the other important thing that the taxpayers might be interested in is that we're not actually paying for these services until work is being done. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So, so they come in and so do they, this. They, yeah, so they basically organize the, the, the budget. You can kind of pick and choose what needs to be done. Um, they kind of guide us in what makes sense as far as priorities, and then they get paid. Basically, they're the project manager, and, and they're getting paid for their services and organizing the work to be completed. That so sounds uh, awesome. The second part of my question is, I don't know where to see it in the booklet, but where can I find the uh, current level of the various reserve funds? Yeah. 
what's coming up. Well, that's what's coming no, up. It's what's the coming. fund balance page report, page Carl. Page 30. Page 30. Thank you. And that was as of the close of FY21's audit. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now, too, that what these last three articles are for is to appropriate money from various different places um, uh, to, and it's, it may sound a little confusing at first, but there's a, we're basically talking about three different building funds. Uh, one for Stockbridge that already exists, one for Rochester that exists but has no money in it, and a third, and tell me to shut up at some point if I say something wrong, um, but, uh, and a third, which we think is the going forward building fund, which is the joint fund. And the idea is by the end of this um, ballot uh, initiative tomorrow, we hope that you will approve money in all three of these funds. Um, and that that will allow us to spend money in specific places, specifically on stock, specifically on Rochester, and then building up our joint capital fund. That was sort of diving into what we're about to talk about now. And that's what what these what these accounts look like. Um, is the next slide, I believe. I changed the order around because it was a little confusing. Oh, so you wanted so to do the articles first. So that's what Parks is doing, is just fixing yep. it. This I figured we could was... read Article 9 and 10 yep. first, Let's do and it. then actually do the picture of what it would look like. OK. Uh, so 9, 10, just... and 11, should I read all three? Uh, yeah, you can do all yep. three if you prefer. So Article 9, shall the voters authorize the school board to transfer the proceeds from the Dandelion Building sale in the amount of $70,904 which are part of the June 30, 2021 audited fund balance estimated to be $284,554 to the Rochester Capital Improvements and Maintenance of Facilities Fund. Okay, and then 10 would be, shall the voters authorize the school board to establish a Rochester Stockbridge Capital Improvements and Maintenance of Facilities Fund. All right, that's the joint one we're talking about. In Article 11, shall the voters authorize the school board to transfer part of the audited fund balance existing on June 30th, 2021, estimated to total $284,554 in an amount not to exceed $63,650 to the Rochester Stockbridge Capital Improvements and Maintenance of Facilities Fund. So you see we're doing the, the first article nine is to put money in. Now, it, it should be told that, whoa, dandelion daycare, that was taken care of a long time ago, right? That was sold a long time ago. And the money, the problem was we set up a, a, a building fund, but we didn't know that we had to vote that money in at that time. And so that money went into the general fund and is essentially part of our budget carrying over year after year. That's right. And, What's that? In the surplus. surplus. In the surplus. And so we felt as a board that it was very important to identify that money as specifically money toward Rochester and put it in its own fund at the amount of, of the sale. So then Article 10 is to establish this new joint fund. Of course, going forward with one school, two campuses, we need to think you know, together. And the idea of to take another part of the surplus this year and put it into that building fund, which is what Article 11 does. Now, that was my explanation. Do you have any questions that could then be answered by people even much more expert than me? And just to give clarification, when you look at the fund balance in the audit, it was not named appropriately by the auditors. So the fund balance that's represented there was the stock bridge reserve fund. And that balance is different than what you see on the screen because the board authorized us to use some of that Stockbridge reserve fund for the generator that went into the building this year. Did you hear that? For the generator. 
got paid for, which is perfectly appropriate. Any further questions on Article 9, 10, and 11, which are about fund balances and funding them? Sure. Yeah, Bill. I just want to commit Carl uh, Grappi uh, and focusing in on capital improvements. Uh, so many organizations, they just live by the next year, or the next month, or the next week, uh, and they allow this accumulated back balance of un poorly maintained or you're not preparing for the future. And the whole idea of having capital uh, improvement funds is to make sure that we are prepared, that we know that we're gonna need monies and that we have the flexibility of either paying as based, based on the reserve funds or using the reserve funds as uh, uh, partial pay downs with, with, with bonding. So we're doing something responsible here. Uh, I think it's worth the voter support um, and um, uh, yeah, we're heading in the right direction. Any further questions on Article 9, 10, or 11? Any further questions? Uh, yes, Nancy Woolley. I just do have a question. I had occasion this winter uh, to come weeks and the weekends to basketball games. Mm -hmm. And it was really quite exciting to be here seeing all these little kids running up and down the court. The big problem was there was no place to sit. Yes. So we had no bleachers. And I'm curious to know if you have plans to replace some bleachers. Yes, I have like four choices right now. And I'm going to send them to Tara and the insurance people to make sure I'm not buying something that they're going to tell me. <laughs> I can't use because <laughs> that's kind of the way it works. The previous bleachers we had a someone come this summer to do a safety audit, and the guy specializes in bleachers, and he looked at the wooden bleachers and said these are not safe. And I said, oh well, what do I have to do to fix them? Take and them out. He, he said, it, it, pretty much. There was not not even an inkling of a suggestion. Yeah. So we pulled them out for safety reasons, and then um, Jesse our head custodian here in Rochester has been great about researching some different choices that'll help fill that need while also allowing optimal space during PP class without injury. Yep. Well, it was fun to come to the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if we it's had great to have to go back. But I'm really glad you heard that you are going to the mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and another point that I asked about today, um, I think it was a handful of Stockbridge kids who were also part of the basketball program Absolutely. here at Rochester, yeah. which is the ideal situation that the gym is getting used by both Absolutely. students from both schools. Absolutely. And obviously, because of COVID, um, the mixing of the two campuses, which was a real goal of the merger, um, started and then really had to stop. And I, but I'm, I, I think things being hopefully going in the same direction toward next year is there's going to be much more of that mixing happening. Um, and uh, we look forward to that. Yes. Carl, you had a question, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, skipped Article 8, the election of uh, directors, is that because there's really nothing to say about it? Or uh, it, 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 was that oversight? No, it's, it's the difference between when you have an informational meeting and the actual warning you're going to see tomorrow. Um, so we don't actually talk about um, the people who are running for election here in the meeting, but you will make a choice. I just will say that um, Justine, who's on tonight, uh, Kavakis, is, um, is a write-in. Um, it just sort of happened, the timing, that her name was not put in for the ballot. But um, is that correct, Justine? That you should be a write in for the Stockbridge candidate. Whoop, you're, you're muted, Justine. You're muted, Justine. Actually, it looks like her microphone's not working. Oh, I think you're. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I couldn't unmute this whole time. Um, I believe I am a write in. I did um, a little bit of Facebook social media campaigning, but yeah, that's, that's my understanding as well. And then the two other candidates were just Robert Mayer and myself. Um, so yeah, it's just a, it, it's, it's just a slight disconnect between the informational meeting and the uh, the actual uh, ballot that you'll see tomorrow. There will be another article eight will be there, and that will be the candidates. But we don't. Very good, thank you. Any further questions? I'd just like to compliment you on a 
fine report. Oh, thank you. Um, and the explanation tonight. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. And our media specialist, whose name is uh, the person who helped. Oh, Kate McLean. Kate. Yeah. McLean, Kate McLean, and she works through the SU. She does. She works through the SU, and she, because I know personally, as Jenny, who's in here tonight, also knows what it's like to put one of these together by yourself. Um, uh, so it's so nice to have someone helping us out. It's really great. And I think, uh, if anybody, any of you who read the Herald that have noticed in the past year, so um, more pictures of things that are happening in the area schools. Not only Rochester and Stockbridge, but Chelsea and stuff, all the ones in the in the same SU. She's been sending me yeah. sometimes one time every week. Okay. But, um, and, you know, there'll be more this week, which is great because you know I love to have school news in the paper. Yes, yeah. it's really She's organized us all. That's great. As administrators, to get off. Any other questions? Um, I encourage you all to. Go vote and tell your friends and neighbors to vote. And um, um, hopefully we've done a good job tonight and you will give us our budget that we asked for for the next year and we'll keep going, building these schools even stronger. Make a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Seconded, seconded by Amy. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Have a good evening.